I wish to convey my continued thanks and appreciation for the honor of this laureateship bestowed upon me. And I'd like to begin what is my penultimate address, Dr. Smith, just to remind you, with a brief epigraph written in 1864 by the Reverend Edward Hartley Dewitt, an Irish-Canadian Methodist minister, editor, and author. And the title of, of today's address is Stone by Bloody Stone. Quoting Reverend Dewitt, a national literature is an essential element in the formation of national character. It is not merely the record of a country's mental progress. It is the expression of its intellectual life, the bond of national unity, and the guide of national energy. It may be fairly questioned whether the whole range of history presents the spectacle of a people firmly united politically without the subtle but powerful cement of a patriotic literature. More than a century later, the eminent Canadian scholar David Tarras writes that Canadian nationhood has been slow to evolve and Canadians slow to find collective symbols, standards, and ideals. Many observers still regard the Canadian identity as incomplete and fragile. Fair remains about Canada's cohesiveness, integrity, and existence. These statements bookend 120 years of Canadian writing, yet a clear desire persists for Canadian writers to affirm a national Canadian identity through their work. Somewhat ironically similar to the Virgin Islands, Canadian self-image is largely constructed between the poles of Britain and the United States. These two imperial metropoles continue to tug, along with Canada to a lesser extent, on the canon of Caribbean literature. It is worth noting that with little exception, most seriously considered Caribbean writing continues to be published between London, New York, and Toronto. As the world retreats from the experiment of globalism, what then does it mean to have a literature within which we imbue so much, a la Reverend Dewitt, our collective intellect, our energies, our very essence and ideals, produced en masse for audiences who are not us? That is a question wrought with more than I can possibly extract for today's purposes, because I fear it is a problem we have not yet created for ourselves in the Virgin Islands. The American Argentinian critic William Henry Hudson distills that problem in clear and brutal terms. Literature is the progressive revelation, age by age, of a nation's mind and character. It is the record of the unfolding of that nation's genius and character. The problem as framed is inescapable, inevitable. You see, for now we must ask ourselves, is there yet such a thing as a Virgin Islands literature? The question causes me great discomfort and frustration. In the trilogy of plays, The Coast of Utopia, by the acclaimed Czech-British playwright Tom Stoppard, he imagines the Russian literary figure Vissarion Belinsky to proclaim the words, as a nation we have no literature. The statement seems mad that a country with such a rich tradition of letters as Russia could be accused as being void of a literary tradition. But what Belinsky belabors is not an absence of writing, but rather a lack of direction or purpose to it. As he famously told the writer Nikolai Gogol, the reader is always ready to forgive a writer for a bad book, but never a pernicious one. <laughs> 
My friends, with such a paucity of books being produced by and for Virgin Islanders, we cannot abide a bad one. How can you have a literature if you're not actively creating one? Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie once said that the stories of Africa should be written by Africans. I similarly believe that every Virgin Islander who can has a measure of responsibility to do their part in the writing of Virgin Island stories. You will note that I do not deign refer to that in the singular. There is no single story to be told. And the beauty of growing a literature is its commitment to contain all. And so we must be suspicious of distillation, of division, of essentialism in the construction of a literature. These many figures from so many different cultures and traditions are articulating a common anxiety fixed in the cultural and identifying expectations a society places upon its written tradition. We must be careful that these expectations do not bind, do not limit, do not hinder the imaginations we are still endeavoring to nurture in potential and emerging writers. The Grenadian novelist Tobias Buckle imagines intergalactic Rastaman. The Syntomian Cadwell Turnbull imagines aliens descending upon Charlotte and Mali. A literature built out of a small place must be big enough to include both the romantic and the realist, the traditional and the avant-garde, the sacred and the profane, the familiar, the esoteric, the mundane, the fantastic. I'm deliberately here avoiding the N-word, national, nationality, nationhood can be a type of quicksand. The concept and its reality are too mutable, fluid, dangerous. Where is the line, the border? Who decides who is part and who is not? What is and what isn't? It is too soon. The label national at this point is an attempt to create categories. As the Booker Prize winning Jamaican novelist Marlon James says, at the core of categorization is an attempt to make something smaller. And having produced a small library of literary work concerned with the people, landscape, and histories of this place, with only a couple novels, a handful of poetry collections and memoirs, and not yet any meaningful literary criticism, it is too soon to draw the borders around a nation of letters. Too many of us are more in love with the product than the process, too eager to get to the finish line before the pistol has fired. Like many rough perceptions of local culture, too much of what we write has been allowed to fall into unvarnished nostalgia for a blurred period post-emancipation and pre-World War. We still seem afraid of nuance, of problematizing, of allowing us and our heroes to be flawed, to be human. Edward Baugh best articulated this dilemma in a seminal essay in the literary magazine Tapia in 1977, adapted from a speech he had presented entitled, The West Indian Writer and His Quarrel with History. Fundamentally, we are still wrestling with the unsaid fear that we are a people operating in a void, exiled from history, from power, from agency. At its root, it is a rot within the mind, a fatalist expectation that, that we are not participants of history or culture, but rather eternally relegated to various forms of serfdom that reinforce the colonialist hierarchy. Simply put, these attitudes cut us off from any prospect of collective, intellectual, or spiritual growth, much less equip us for any discourse of political or social ambition. Our poets have seemed the most likely 
to push against these tendencies. And whether it was the accessibility and mobility of the form or its ability to create a healthy degree of opaqueness, our poets were much more likely to make something subversive. The poetic traditions of the Virgin Islands, while Anglo-centric in aesthetic, can be traced safely back to the Victorian era with the Shakespearean named Anagadian poet Alpheus Osorio Norman. Norman was an obvious student of the Romantics, and while we are told that he wrote prolifically, only about seven of his poems survive. Norman's metronomic Alexandrines were rigid in rhythm, but in them, slaves revolted and black sailors were eulogized alongside expected European tropes like Greek sea gods and Vikings. Many followed Norman, primarily poets like Kenny and Roy Hodge, Sheila Heinemann, Quincy Letsam and others, through to our contemporaries like April Glasgow, Lynette Rabsat, and Kamal Letsam. Others were inclined to meander across from poetry into short fiction and nonfiction, including Verna Penn Mall, Jenny Wheatley, and Pat Turnbull. Further, there are several memoirs and nonfiction error surveys of particular interest, like Charles Wheatley's Portraits of the Education System and Norma Benjamin's History of Nursing and other similarly purposed works. The most popularly known and read publications are perhaps Vernon Pickering's A Concise History of the British Virgin Islands and the books and pamphlets published by Norval Harrigan and Pearl Varlack in the 1970s and 80s. Isaac Dukan did much important work on both the American and British Virgin Islands in the 70s and well, many of these texts unfortunately have fallen out of print and are very difficult for the average person in the BVI to put their hands on. I'll plug here the Virgin Island Studies Institute where you can put your hands on them. Given this dearth of widely available historical texts and many other disparate reasons, much of our history and our culture continues to subsist in local legend and oral tradition. It is telling then that while pursuing these academic, doc these academic documents, much of what I have found has been written by non-locals whose work is accessible via university and publishing networks. By and large, the several works we now produce are not produced for international publication or consumption. They exist precariously, falling out of print depending on the author's ability or proclivity to support a book's life considering that too many local authors continue to pay for book production rather than pursue the traditional process of submitting manuscripts to publishers and agents. Too many authors still see publication as a vanity project and not a serious endeavor worth the rigor and lack of immediate gratification. How can we have a literature if we have not grown a desire to produce the best literature we can, even if it means likely a longer and more painful process. How can you have a literature when you make a book so easy to disappear? I've come to a conclusion. I think the state of our literature, or at least our regard for it, is reflective of a similar malaise that often affects our culture and hinted at by the junior minister. It is a symptom that is akin to why so many of our highly considered restaurants do not trade in flavors or interpretations of traditional Virgin Islands cuisine. Surely, fish and fungi can translate into dishes served from your local mom and pop shop to any fine dining restaurant. It's not that hard if my non-Epicurean mind can visualize snapper and polenta, surely fish and fungi is easy to upscale. Surely it makes more sense to serve Wilkes and conch in season than to continue to import Canadian mussels. What is it that allows some to assume 
that something not being from the Virgin Islands suggests that it is better or more worthy of our respect? What is it that prevents us from celebrating the greatness of our own modern luminaries before the world does it for us? The writer might as well be an athlete. She must be willing to train, to sacrifice, to be broken and remade into the author she must be. We can no longer abide the shortcuts when the stories and voices of these islands must be made to resound throughout the world. We can no longer be satisfied by a single lonely flame. We must be ready to light a fire to grow this flickering little literature into a towering blaze. Our literature is alive, but we must continue to grow it. To do that, us writers must prepare ourselves. We must write boldness and truth. We must hone our craft. We must envision worlds no one has before. This place is richer than we think, full of universes waiting to be written and bigger stories to be told. Thank you.